Bin Yong Kim, the president of the World Bank. It's great to have you with RT today, sir. Thank you so much for having me. So you pledged to continue the World Bank's mission to fight world poverty. It's actually a policy which recently became priority for the bank, but a startling 80% of people in the world still live under $10 per day. I mean, do you ever stop and say, wow, I'm fighting windmills? Well, you know, uh, uh, I feel that uh, I have the best job in the world. You know, the, the fact that we walk in every day and on the wall of the World Bank uh, states, our dream is a world free of poverty. You know, there, there, there are 80% um, uh, of the world living on less than $10 a day, but there are also 1.2 billion people living on less than $1.25 a day. So the fact that fighting absolute poverty, extreme poverty, uh, conditions that no one should li live under uh, is, I think, one of the great privileges of working for a group like the World Bank Group. But when you think of a world poverty, in general, it's still such an abstract thing. I mean, I know that you've had a remarkable career as a doctor working in the field every day in places like South America, Russia, Siberia. Maybe do you feel that you were more useful than helping directly people than fighting something that's so intangible, you know? Well, you know, um, it's become more and more tangible over time. So, for example, we know now that investing in health investing in education, investing in social protection programs are critical to lay the foundations for the kind of economic growth that will lift people out of poverty. Another thing we know is that every country in the world has to think about how to grow their private sector. You know, this is a real issue here uh, in Russia. Uh, President Putin has said that he wants to improve his business climate and wants to move quickly up the rankings uh, to be among the top 20 um, uh, countries in the world in terms of ease of doing business. Every single country in the world has to figure out how to grow their private sector so that businesses can grow and create the kind of jobs that people want. If you look around the world and, and, and see the kinds of crises that have erupted, uh, especially, for example, in the Arab Spring, those crises were specifically about the lack of jobs, uh, the lack of access uh, to the economy, the, the inability to, to, to feed their children. So we now know a lot about what it takes to lift people out of poverty, provide them health, education, social protection, and then figure out ways of having the right kind of fiscal policies, the right kind of monetary policies, grow your private sector. So our message is, while they have to be tailored to each individual situation, uh, is very encouraging in a sense, because we think there is a path for all countries to, to grow their economies, to provide the basics of uh, health education so that, that their people can live productive and dignified lives. Can I ask you something? What were some of your thoughts about World Bank before you became its head? Because it's an organization that's in the constant state of becoming and change. I know that in 2000 you even wrote a book somewhat criticizing the bank. Well, you, you know, this is a, a, it, I'm so glad you said that because very few interviewers actually understand how much the bank has changed. You know, one of my first trips to Washington, D.C. was actually to protest the bank. Um, we were part of a movement called 50 Years is Enough, and at that time we did not feel that the bank was on the forefront of issues like environmental sustainability, gender equality, uh, the importance of uh, access to health care. And over time, as the evidence has grown, the bank has shown that it focuses on data, that it focuses on fact, that it tries to take evidence from the studies, often that they do themselves, that uh, give a clear idea of just what you need to do in order to grow your economy, to provide jobs, and to provide those basic services. So the bank of 20 years ago is very different than the bank of today. Today, uh, I have to say, the, uh, the, the fundamental values and mission of the bank uh, are completely in line with the work that I've done for my entire life. I'm just going to continue with the thought of a World Bank being under permanent pressure mm -hmm. and permanent criticism from left, from the anti-globalists, from the occupiers, I mean, you name it, and it's been going on for decades and decades. It does still have that image of being this vehicle for the United States and for multinationals to increase the grip over the developing countries, developing growth. Can you change that? I think it's already changed. Uh, one of the things I did when I came in uh, was to spend most of my first six months walking around the World Bank, uh, both in Washington, D.C. and in the countries that I visited, and I asked them some fundamental questions. Well, who are we? What are we here to do? What are our most fundamental values? And how does it relate to our mission and our strategy? And what I found was that there was a deep, and there is, a deep vein of passion 
for fighting poverty. You know, we have some of the brightest people in the world. These are people with PhDs in economics and engineering and all these fields from the top institutions in the world. They can make a lot more money if they went outside the World Bank into the private sector. But the reason they stay in the World Bank is because they want to fight poverty. And so I think that it's, a, it's, it's far more a public relations issue than it is a substance issue inside the World Bank. Person after person after person tells me I came to the World Bank Group because I wanted to fight poverty. My job now is to make sure that everyone else in the world understands that that's what we do. Because there are three main points to people understanding what you do is good and it's not in the interest of big corporations and richer nations. The first point being that, you know, donor countries, donor governments are the richest countries in the world and they would not do anything unless it serves their national interests and interests of their national businesses corporations and as well. I mean, they're not here for charity. They're really here for profit. That's the general understanding. Second point is that, you know, the World Bank has always been under uh, U.S. power, more or less, because it's always been headed by an American, and it has the most uh, voting power within the bank, you know. So you can't really talk about the even-handed um, approach within the bank. And there are a lot of local communities who actually tell you that, you know, you, you know you, when you come to help me, it actually helps you more than it helps me in the long run. Those are the three main points. How do you react to them? So, um, uh, uh, first of all, um, uh, when I was elected for the first time in history, there was an actual election, and I had to run against two other candidates. And uh, I spent a lot of time uh, campaigning for this position, including flying here to Russia to, to make my case that I'd be the, 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 the best next World Bank president. You know, there's no question that there are very powerful countries in the world, the U.S. being one of them. But I can guarantee you that at the World Bank, the issues that we talk about are very focused. For example, uh, we are always looking for the issues that are in everyone's interest to tackle. Um, let me give you two examples. Uh, the situation in the Sahel with Mali. You know, this is a situation that is uh, so worrisome to the entire global community, and our role there, once the fighting slows down, is going to be very specific. Our role is to try to provide the kind of support so that Mali and other countries in the Sahel can actually build their economies. Uh, what the young people want are jobs. Uh, if you go to countries like Cote d'Ivoire or Liberia, other places that have had these enormous conflicts, the critical task is to rebuild their economies so that former soldiers can get a good job. Now, uh, this is in everybody's interest, and at the World Bank, we especially focus on those issues. Climate change, for example. As I said, you know, 20 years ago, the World Bank was not at the forefront in terms of leading the fight against climate change, thinking about environmental sustainability. We want to move into that position now. I've been writing a lot about it. I've been talking to lots of different groups. We want to be on the cutting edge of fighting climate change because, in my view, there are so many things that go beyond the political level. Um, the negotiations around the Kyoto Protocol, these negotiations are critically important. They've got to go on. In the meantime, we've got to try to build um, functioning carbon markets, you know, find a price on, on, on carbon. We've got to try to remove fuel subsidies. We've got to try to build better cities that aren't so polluting. We've got to improve agriculture. The World Bank is going to be on the very forefront of those issues that are not in one country's interest, but are that, but are that in everyone's interest. What happens when someone like Hugo Chavez quits the World Bank saying that too much American power and then he gets Chinese money to finance his projects? Do you stop to think maybe the balance of powers is changing? You know, the world is becoming too camped or multipolar. Maybe we've got competition. Well, you know, there's a, there's a lot of different organizations that are putting money into development. Um, the Chinese have a, have a very robust program in many parts of the world. There are other multilateral development banks, and there's a lot of uh, uh, individual countries that put their official development system, assistance into countries. But let me assure you, there's plenty of poverty to go around for everyone in terms of investing in, in developing countries. Uh, our expertise is pretty specific. We're 66 years old. We have 188 member countries. We work in over 100 countries. We have tremendous expertise, not only in terms of the data and the, and the, and the articles we've written and the studies we've done, but just in the lived experience uh, of our employees. We actually know how to get bridges built, how to get roads built. And so this is our great strength. I think that no matter how many uh, new players enter the scene, there will always be a central role for the World Bank because of our expertise, because of our global reach, and because of the fact that our primary concern, and this is very clear, I've made it clear, the board has, uh, has made it clear with me, ending poverty, building shared prosperity is what we do.
when we talk here about fighting poverty and inequality, do you sympathize with that 99% with the occupiers? Well, um, uh, our main goal is, in fact, uh, to work with an even smaller uh, group uh, in addition to the 99%. And uh, the group we're talking about is the 1.2 billion people living in, in extreme poverty. It's 20% of the world. Now, but that's not the only group that we're working on. What are we trying to do? We're trying to ensure that the group that live in extreme poverty can enter the middle class. I mean, that's, that's really what we want to do. They're going to become consumers. They're going to become participants in the global economy. But in countries like Russia, we also think we have a very important role to play. You know, Russia is trying to do things like improve its business environment, improve its health care, improve its education. And there's tremendous expertise in this country. But we have expertise that stretches across 100 countries. We have uh, uh, helped and, 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 and experienced working with lots of other high middle income countries, Korea, um, Indonesia, there's many countries that we've worked with and we think that that experience brought here to Russia will give the Russian professionals, who are of course extremely qualified, ideas about what they might do to improve the systems that they have. We feel that we're relevant in all those countries. We feel that fundamental questions of, of equality are, are, um, are central to what we do, and we will continue in that path. When I mentioned the Occupy Wall Street, I mean, really brought together people that were so different, students and scholars. I mean, even Joseph Stiglitz worked for the World Bank. A lot of people that I've spoken to, Americans, Nobel Peace Prize winners, they say that the inequality, the issue that spurred the very protest, really puts the United States in great nation and consequently the rest of the world, the inequality. Do you agree? Well, um, uh, one of the things that, that we focus on, and you know, we don't have projects in the United States, and the uh, United States is a, is a member country, but we don't have projects in the United States. But in a very specific sense, here's what we do. We look at what it is that causes instability in societies. And what we found is that if you lock people out of participating in the economic growth of a country, you get situations like you saw in the Arab Spring. Now, uh, we're not talking uh, 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 specifically about a particular program. Uh, we're not recommending um, uh, uh, any kind of political solutions. That's not what we do. What we focus on is how can you do the right things in the government so that you create an environment where the private sector can grow the kind of jobs that people really want. Ninety percent of all jobs in developing countries are created by the private sector. This is our most recent World Development Report. So our, 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 our role is fairly clear. We think that um, uh, an inclusive approach to economic growth is by far the most effective and, and the most stabilizing way for a country to grow. And that's based on evidence that, in fact, we've collected over many, many years. With Europe being in critical state, do you feel like you can pour more money now into the ailing European countries rather than third world countries? Well, well let me just say that um, over the last um, nine to 12 months, we've seen very remarkable acts of solidarity on the part of uh, the European countries. I think there are many people who doubted uh, whether uh, the Europeans would step up and ensure the future of the euro and ensure the, the, the stability of the European Union. And I think now there's just no question that the tail risks have been decreased. Uh, we still have a lot to do. Uh, countries still have a lot to do in terms of moving forward on the structural forms that they've promised to, to undertake. But uh, it's a much different G20 meeting today than it was six months or nine months ago. Jim Yonkin, thank you very much for this interview. Thank you.